Well, hello, everyone, uh, and welcome to a very special edition of Salesman on Fire, the podcast. I've been looking forward to this for quite some time. I'm your host, Carson Hetty. Uh, today, I'm joined by the one and only Haywood Gould. Uh, he's authored a dozen books. Uh, he's a screenwriter, film director. Uh, he's written and or directed nine films, including a couple of my favorites, One Good Cop, uh, which he wrote, wrote and directed, and uh, Fort Apache, The Bronx, which he also wrote. Um, and he's also well known for the book and script for one of my all-time favorite films, Cocktail. Haywood, thank you so much for joining me. How are you doing today? I'm doing very well. How about you? I'm doing great. I uh, good. I remember when I was about 10 and my parents went to see this movie called Cocktail and I knew nothing about it. Uh, and I was talking to my wife the other day and uh, I don't know if you remember when you could order those DVD collections um, and you could order like 20 DVDs. Well, I ordered, uh, that's when I first saw Cocktail uh, when I moved into my own apartment. And uh, since then, it's become a classic for me. Um, so this, this is uh, this is like a dream come true for me. So I appreciate you indulging me today. Oh, great. Okay, good. Well, yeah, I'm going to jump into the question. So, you know, look, I, our careers, they often don't go in the direction that we expect. And I've been very fascinated by the fact that you didn't set out to write movies, um, and yet you've created and written and directed some starring vehicles for some of my favorite actors, like Paul Newman, who's up here on my wall, uh, Michael Keaton, Tom Cruise, and and others. How did movies enter the pictures uh, for your career? Well, everything was uh, has been kind of haphazard for me. I had no plan when I started out. The only thing I knew from a very early age was I wanted to write the great American novel from the time when I was a kid. Literally, I, I wrote stories. So that I knew. But I had no plan on how to do that other than to write it. I didn't have a career plan. I didn't think I was going to get into movies. I got into movies totally by accident. I played basketball in a playground with, with a guy who I, I became friendly with. And he was a story editor of a TV show called NYPD, which was, which was a half-hour show. Uh, in the late 60s, and I and I had been a reporter for the New York Post, so I told him some stories that I had covered. He said, why don't you make episodes out of those? And so he took me to visit the, um, uh, the producer of the show, and I told this guy, the producer, and he told me, let's go upstairs and see David Soskran. David Soskran was a big shot producer of, of his day. So I went upstairs, and Soskran was sitting there, and I told him the stories. He said, okay. Now, what's so amazing about that whole you know, chain of events is occasionally I'll tell that story in a seminar to young students and they go, oh my God, that would never happen now. You'd have to go through a hundred people. You'd have to write three spec scripts. It's terrible, because I just walked in and got, so I told them the, story, the, the stories and I was so green when I wrote the scripts that I put quotation marks next to the dialogue, which is totally not necessary. Again, when I tell that story to younger people, they go, you would have been fired. That's it. You're over. They would never. They would, they would have lost faith in you. Me, they just laughed. They said, don't do that again. And that was it. So it's uh, when people talk about progress, there's not been a lot of progress in the field that I'm in anyway, you know. So um, I wanted to write the, um, uh, uh, the Great American novel, but I got a job. I was hanging around a Greenwich Village hustling chess, actually. And I met a guy who, who worked for the New York Post, and he and it was just after a strike. And a lot of the young people who worked for the Post had left. So he said they needed a copy boy. A copy boy is somebody who just, you know, you know, kind of schlifts stuff around, gets coffee for people. So, but it was a very hard job to get because it was in a major New York newspaper. So I had um, been to France. I'd lived in France for almost a year. And I spoke French. This guy told me, tell the managing editor that you speak French because his wife is French. So I wrote a note uh, to the managing editor of the, of the paper, which he saw. Again, people told me that would never happen today. If you wrote a note to the CEO of somewhere, you'd never be, hear from anybody. Never, never mind have, have a person you know, read it. So I wrote that note, and I said I was, um, I spoke French, and I wanted to, I'd been a, a lifelong reader of the New York Post, which was true. I read, a, I read the sports page. That's, that's about all I read for the first 20 years of my life, you know. But after that, and so they called me in, and I had the same kind of interview that other people say cannot be had today. I spoke to one person smoking a pipe in a small office, and he said to me, so you're saying me to the New York Post? 
what's the entire sports staff telling every sports writer in the New York Post? So I did, because I knew them all. I mean, I read them all. And he said, okay, you're hired. He said, it's $50 a week, and you can make more if you're good. If you're not good, you'll be making $50 a week for the rest of your life. So you decide. <laughs> so I took the job, and, that, and then I became a kid. Then again, luckily, they gave me a tryout to be a reporter. I passed the tryout, and they hired me as a reporter. And then from, from being a reporter, um, I decided that I wanted to write a novel about reporters. And it just, it just seemed to move kind of, I wouldn't say flawlessly or seamlessly, but everything just seemed to happen one after another in a way, in a peculiar way. So I quit the post. Uh, because I wanted to write a novel, and everybody was really angry at me. My family was furious at me, and my wife at the time was furious. They they were all right to be furious, and but I was convinced that I was going to write the Great American Novel, so I started to write the Great American Novel, which I did not do, and not even close. And um, then th that marriage broke up. I went to Europe, came back, and somehow or another, uh, when I started writing, um, oh yeah. Then I needed a job, and I'd been, I'd been playing a lot of poker, and I, and I owed a guy $900. And he said to me, well, look, he says, come to work in my bar. So I went to work in his bar, and he said, one of the guys will teach you how to be a bartender. And one of the guys there was really nice guy, actually, because I didn't know what I was doing the first you know, night I was behind the bar. And he taught me all the tricks of the trade. I became a bartender. And while I was a bartender, I decided to, um, I had a couple of books published. And I decided I want to write the great American novel about bartending, wow. which I then did. I didn't know if it's a great American novel or not, but uh, I wrote it. Well, I think so. Yeah. Oh, good. Thanks. And uh, things just kind of you kind of moved along in that direction. Then I started writing scripts for this because I made friends with this guy. And the thing that always gets me is, I know I'm, I'm repeating this, is how I never was worried about anything. I don't know why I was not. I didn't worry about money. I realized then I didn't worry about money because life was very different in those days. There was no, um, you know, cell phones. There was no internet. Uh, rent was controlled, at least in New York City it was. So if you had an apartment and you were paying a low rent, you had that apartment forever. Right. You know? So I never really thought about money. I, I, I never worried about money. Um, I only wanted to get books published. And so that was... You know how I started. I love that. I love that story. Thanks for sharing that. Um, some themes that I see out of that, because I always look at my career and I think, you know, it's easy to connect the dots backwards sometimes. Obviously, we yeah. can't connect the dots forward. You didn't know uh, where things were going to go. You didn't have a plan or a roadmap, but uh, you followed your passions, right? You took some risks. Yeah. You had, it sounds like you were uh, in the right place at the right time a few times and uh, also had some great guidance and uh, gravitated towards some people that uh, gave you some really good feedback and guidance and uh, you were opportunistic and I think it's led to a, a, a masterpiece of a career. Now, I do, look, I want to talk a little bit about Cocktail. Um, it's always been one of my favorite films. In fact, one of my friends and I, uh, I'm going to give him a shout out. His name's Jason Smith. Uh, we used to watch it re religiously and uh, just such a fun film. Um, and after I started to really enjoy the film, I went back, I read the book, and actually now my wife will give me gifts from the movie. Like, oh, I have sweet. the Care Bear. I have the Care Bear, the dinosaur, and uh, some other things, and all the books that show up that Tom Cruise holds at any given moment. I also have cardboard cutouts of both Brian Brown and Tom Cruise uh, by my um, my bar here. Let me show you. I've got a got a little stand up bar here. Oh, cardboard cutouts of Tom that. and Brian, and that's then I've got cool. a neon of cocktails and dreams uh, over here. Um, I used to have a bar in my house, but I no longer, we had to sell that house and move. But um, anyway, suffice it to say, I enjoy cocktails. So um, it's kind of my happy place. We even got my, my mug here. But uh, I wrote an article a couple of years ago why cocktail was one of the greatest sales movies of all time. Um, and I kind of based it on the fact that, hey, there's an ambitious protagonist, uh, you know, obviously, um, Brian Flanagan. There's a great 80s soundtrack. There's the mentor figure in Doug Coughlin. Um, and then there's just valuable lessons throughout the film and for, throughout the book uh, from everybody from Uncle Pat all the way to, of course, our friend, logical negativist Doug Coughlin. What was Cocktail all about for you? Because I'm sure it still 
starts conversations regularly for oh, you. Totally. Um, and obviously it was a semi autobiographical book about your bartending experience. So tell me more. Well, I wanted to, um, I wanted to write a book as an homage to all the people I work with, because um, the one thing about the kind of area that I was in, except for a few jobs uptown in the commercial area where most of the bartenders I worked with were professional bartenders and they were union members and uh, local six or local 15. But the people downtown in the Soho, Greenwich Village, kind of West Village area had started out to be something else. The painters, actors, actresses, writers, musicians, and had ended up uh, going to work in restaurants because that was the easiest job to have and help you keep doing your other thing. You could kind of pick your own schedule in a way. You could work nights or you could work days too if you wanted to. And uh, then had the time to do your, you know, to do what you really wanted to do. So most of those people were, were, did not start out to be bartenders or raiders or waitresses or even cooks actually. So I was interested in them and I was interested in, in writing a novel about that world and about um, the world of slowly maybe realizing that you're going to fail or that you're on the failure track yeah. and how you deal with that and what your plans become if you have plans. And most of the people I knew in those days um, kind of just kind of winged it. You know, you went from one thing to the next, just like I just did, just described. Right. Um, there were a few people who had a, who, who tried to kind of, kind of, you know, uh, regularize their lives um, in one way or another, couldn't do it for, and so a lot of alcoholism set in, a lot of broken relationships, drugs, you know, not a, not necessarily a happy time for people as well, but the time behind the bar that you worked with your friends in restaurants where you, you were friendly with people who worked there and you were also kind of friendly at a certain point with people who came there, the regulars, were fun times. Right. You know, I mean, and the only time I did it for about 10 years, 11 years, it was OK for eight years. Then after a while, it started getting old and it wasn't fun anymore. And then I was had to stop. I had to get out of there. You know, and I didn't. And because um, I started. Um, you know, writing uh, these TV scripts, which was pure luck. And, um, you know, from then came the books and a uh, Fort Apache was written uh, while I was still a bartender. I was working as a bartender and I was going up, to, going, going up to the Bronx and hanging out with the cops in the Bronx every day and night. So I wrote the script when I was a bartender. I wrote a fair amount of, I mean, I wrote two books as I, while I was a bartender and well, three almost. And uh, most of the stuff I did, I did while I was sending bar. Or, I mean, a lot of the stuff I did, I did, I did was sending bar. And uh, that kind of saved me in a way because I did not go out drinking at four o'clock in the morning with everybody else because I had to go home and go to sleep. So I did it once in a while. I did it more than I should have, but I didn't do it pretty much every night the way a lot of people I, I knew did because that was a sign of surrender. If you left the place where you'd been pouring drinks at four o'clock in the morning and you went somewhere else, you know, after hours place that was illegal but nobody cared the cops never came in um, you were kind of giving up okay I give up I'll just go here now and get loaded until 10 o'clock in the morning then I'll sleep and wake up and go to work again you know so I didn't do that so I was lucky that I had that that one driving ambition that was planted in me as a kid and I still have it you know so that was uh, that's probably what saved me you know I love it that reminds me of that uh the quote, the uh, days get shorter and shorter and the nights get longer and longer uh, mm -hmm. from cocktail. Um, what I love most about your writing, Haywood, and this is across the board, is that it's not formulaic and predictable. I was actually recently rewatching like One Good Cop and Fort Apache and they go in they go in directions that you can't predict. And I think cocktail is the same way. And I think what's cool about cocktail is that it's really held up well over time. It has a strong following. I remember when it started streaming on Netflix and it was super popular. Uh, what do you think audience, audiences today can take from cocktail? You know, I've had really, and I'm not bragging, but I've had score thousands of conversations with people, emails and stuff, yeah. seminars, and I think there are several things that cocktail offers a viewer, depending on who the viewer is. Sure. You know, I mean, there are people who like a good, who like a nice love story. Sure. They're really sexy people. 
Yeah. You know? And um, I remember when I told one a person I met that I was trying to make a musical out of a cocktail, he said, leave in the stuff with the, yeah, he leave in the stuff on, um, in Jamaica. Don't take that out. <laughs> you know, the swimming scene with Elizabeth Shue. I said, okay, I won't take it out. Don't worry, I won't take it out. So, wait a minute. So you're working on a musical? Well, I was. Cocktail. I'm not anymore. I mean, okay. I, All right. I, I was going to say, where can I get tickets for that? I wish you could. Um, but anyway, um, so there are those people. There are people who worked in, um, I think maybe the majority or a lot of people are people who worked in restaurants and bars yeah. and who identify their experience with the experience of people in the book. And especially the experience of, of people. This is what I've been told by a lot of people, of people who are in there temporarily. They're trying to make it. They have some idea. They have some plan they, or they think they do. Um, and they're just taking this job and they're going to stick it out. And then, again, as people tell me this, you know, the, the weeks go by, you know, days are shorter, but the nights are what kind of thing, and which is, unfortunately, you start to feel for real. And um, they have to face whatever their lives are going to be, you know. So I've had a lot of people talk to me about that. And I've had a lot of people talk to me about the jokes and the kidding around as well. But, you know, the music, music is fantastic in that movie. So, you know, I mean, people really, depending on who they are, you know, they respond to the movie in, in a different way, which may be why it's still popular, because it appeals to different people, different kinds of people all the time, you know. Well, well said. I think that's very true. I know for me, it was always the the inspiration piece. You know, Brian obviously got into bartending very much by accident. You know, he right. had high aspirations that uh, didn't pan out the way he envisioned. And, uh, you know, obviously winds up in the bar and, and falls in love. Um, you know, I got into sales by accident. I actually met my wife through, uh, you know, an old sales job. And so, uh, you know, life kind of takes some interesting turns. And I think cocktail really uh, encompasses that. I also, I think it's funny, you know, when we talk about common uh, or modern day audiences, uh, we have a restaurant actually in town that serves uh, serves some uh, esteemed drinks, and one of them is called Coglin's Law. And uh, the bartender, sadly, was so young that they didn't know what it was. I had to do some educating, right? I had to explain what Coglin's Law was all about. Coglin's Laws are very often known and they're quoted. I always find it funny when I yeah. quote one on social media and somebody comments back. They're brilliant. I love them. My favorite are anything else is always something better. Right. Never show surprise, never lose your cool. But I have to ask you, Haywood, if Doug Coughlin were here today, what would he tell aspiring pupils? What would the 21st century Coughlin's laws be? That's a good question. Um, what would they be? What would he tell people? Well, I think he would be more um, sinister, not sinister, but he'd be a little more involved in the manipulating of, of situations, of finessing certain situations, um, seeing who you can charm and who you don't need, being more cold-blooded about your career than you would have been in, in 1988. You know, unfortunately, that's how I see it. I see, yeah. you know, I, 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 I see people who have to work a lot harder then we had to work. We didn't, we got what we got, you know, and um, a lot of the stuff that we got, we didn't, we didn't really need. So, yeah, I mean, uh, we didn't worry about money. Most people I know, as I said before, because we had enough to cover ourselves. Uh, people in certain, I think also this, this phenomenon of people making billions and billions of dollars on tricks, on hitting the lottery, on some kind of let's TikTok thing that you that you protect, and all of a sudden you, you, you're a big sensation. This has made people nuts. And I don't know if Cog if Cogman would tell them to keep playing the lotteries. I think he would probably tell them to stay off all that because the percentage is not good for you, and you're going to make yourself crazy. You know, and if you don't get it, if you don't get what you want, or if it or if you have to keep pushing and pushing, it'll make you nuts. You know, so I think that he would probably tell them. You know, to be a little more, uh, what's the word, to have a plan, because you need a plan, you know. But that's a good question. I'll have to think about that. I'll write you an email. <laughs> I'll no, I, I, I <laughs> love that. And I think you hit on something. I always thought that given the resources and the luck, Coughlin would have been like a Gordon Gecko of that time. Yeah. He would have been manipulative, manipulative and power hungry, given that opportunity. But he was he was always looking to hustle and make a deal and 
Um, that's that's one of the things I, I think he was. But he realized at the end that he was full of it. So um, too late, unfortunately. Um, what have you been most proud of in your career? You know, I, I, I don't have, I don't really feel pride. It's an interesting thing. It's an interesting question. I've been asked the question before. Um, I don't feel pride for anything I did in the strange. I mean, I'm not ashamed of them. The things I did, they're, they're, um, they worked at products that came out. People consumed them, you know, if you want to call it that. And um, they're, they're gone. Often people will say to me, as you just did, but luckily I knew what you were talking about. They'll quote some really obscure line from one of the other books. And I don't remember that I even wrote that. Yeah. You know? So um, I can't say that I'm really proud of anything I did. I don't have that feeling of pride that you have for children or, or something. If you save somebody from a burning building or stuff like, you know, um, it was it was work that that I worked hard on and um, went on to something else. Yeah, that's what that's about it, you know. Yeah, I'm happy when I if I pick up a book or, or look at a movie once in a while, I see them always by accident. I never want to look at them myself. Because all I see at a certain point are the mistakes I made and what I could have done better. I don't see anything else. But occasionally I do see, see one and I go, oh, that was nice. That was good. That's a good shot. Oh, okay. So I'm kind of happy. I say, well, I did that. That was good. That's about it. That's I like that. I like that because, because, you know, I understand it's, it's hard for me often to go back and reread things that I've written, um, uh, you know, for various, for various reasons. reasons but, but, uh, I always feel like I I'm working like toward work whatever, whatever the next thing, next is. thing is. Well, yeah. well so um, I can respect, I can respect that. that. I also respect, I also respect the writer's need and need desire, and desire to, keep to keep a project, project close to the chest. To the chest. Uh, but, I've uh, read, but I've read that you're doing that you're some doing work, work on, on a sequel, a sequel to, cocktail. to Cocktail. What can yeah. you tell me about it? It was supposed to be a TV series. I don't know if it'll happen or not. Um, I'm very protective of that stuff. Sure. Because sure. Cocktail has a lot of people like you who like to watch it, they like the book. And I don't want to put out some kind of audience grabbing, essentially thing that won't su succeed anyway. Right, right. So I people, you know, want to make a TV series out of it. One uh, Disney, who I work for a lot, came to me and they said, "Can you make the a Brian character a female?" And I said, "Well, there are a lot of female bartenders, but nobody wants to see a movie written by me about a female bartender. I mean, forget it. You know." And so, um, it, and it wouldn't be any good, you know, because I couldn't write that character. That makes so sense. So that makes sense. Th that's how it's gone. I mean, I uh, pretty much um, haven't given up on it yet, but um, I wrote one in which Brian is, al is alive and the kid that he, the son that he, and the children that he had are alive. So now he's being Brian in 19, in 2020, 2023, you know. And he has a son who's a bartender. So I wrote that. They like that. So we'll see what happens. I don't know. It's a very strange. I mean, that business is completely crazy now. So, yeah. I completely understand. I, completely understand. I appreciate, I appreciate you, telling you telling me that telling much. Me that much. Yeah. Because, yeah. because I, I don't talk I don't, too much I don't about the stuff about I work on and what's coming. And, what's and, coming. and, uh, and uh, so I completely you know, respect, but also appreciate the, the nuggets that you've shared here. Anything else that, that we can hit on today? Anything else that you want to share with our audience? This has been amazing. Can't think of anything. Um, <laughs> I mean, um, I still want to be a great writer. I still want to write the great American novel. I haven't done it yet. I'm still working on it. And um, I'm, I still want to, I still look at my work. The most important thing I do is get better at, what, at writing. The rest of the stuff is, is not, I have no control over anyway. So there's no point in even worrying about it, you know. Most of the stuff I've done happened by, Cocktail's a good example, by the way, of something that happened by accident. Because uh, because the guy I worked for at Universal uh, uh, TV was a very, very smart guy. He'd been in Harvard. He was a Harvard MBA. And he was a younger guy. And he'd spent his time in bars. So he appreciated the book. No one else did. And he's the one who gave me the first job writing the screenplay. And when I handed the first draft into him, he made me do 20 or 30 drafts because he wanted to make the Brian character a lot more likable, he called him. Finally, he had it. This was universal. He had a draft that he liked, and he brought it to the head of the Universal Film Studios. And I went out to have a meeting with this guy, and he said to me, "This guy will look like he closed every bar in the city every night, 
said to me, I don't know why, uh, I don't understand the appeal of this bar or the bartender. I don't get it. So they passed. And this, uh, this executive gave the script to another guy, to a guy at Disney, a Ricardo Mestres, who was also an Ivy League type of guy, came from New York City, he knocked around the bar. He that scene, he that scene. Yeah, he said, yeah, this would make a, this would make a good movie. movie. And, and he convinced, he convinced the guys in the Disney, Katzenberg, and Eisner, who were not bar uh, 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 attenders at all. And they didn't know the bar scene at all, but for some reason, they took his word for it, and that's how it started. Two executives who knew what they were talking about and who, who knew the scene, otherwise his picture never would have been made. It's amazing. It's amazing. I, mean, yeah. I mean, there's so there's many, so many like, like, near-miss stories I would imagine yeah. out there. I think it's, it's incredible, incredible that you kind of went out there with, with you know, knowing, you know, knowing what, what you wanted to do. do. And even, and even today, today, you still have you that, still same, have that same aspiration. Your craft, craft is cool. continuing to evolve, and you're continuing to look at new ways to explore uh, doing what you love. And I think that's something that we can all take away from this. So thank you. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's the same thing kind of happened with Fort Apache. Fort Apache... Um, I met these two cops who had a story they wanted to tell. And I, I went to the Bronx and hung out with them for a couple of months. We rode back and forth, went on ride outs. And I had done that as a reporter. So I, it, they were always amazed. They had this picture of a writer, them being cops, kind of like a sissy guy, you know. And they said, hey, you sure you want to do this? Are you sure you want to do this? I said, yeah, I'm sitting in a, in a car with a guy with guns, two guys with guns. I'm, I'm not worried about anything happening to me. And they went, oh, yeah, you're right, you're right. But they, they never really accepted the fact that a writer wasn't some very effete intellectual kind of guy, you know. And um, so I wrote the script in 1972. Everybody read it. Everybody in the country, including people running in the movie business, <laughs> turned it down. And it was over. And then I showed the script to Susskind as a writer. He said to me, I need a writing sample. Give me a sample of your writing. So I gave him this. I gave him the, you know, a draft of the script, and he told me you know, the next day he said, I'm going to make this a movie. I'm going to make this as a movie. And so he tried to make it as a movie. And then his company was bought by HBO. And, and he had a three-picture deal with HBO. And so one of the pictures was Fort Apache. So he made Fort Apache. And, and that's just one of the stories I could tell you. I mean, everything that's happened to me in the movie business has been that kind of a very, very coincidental, accidental you know, occurrence. I've been lucky, been really lucky, you know, in that respect. You've created your own luck. You had a quality product and uh, yeah. you, you know, right place, right time. And my gosh, you got one of my favorites up there, Paul Newman. And yeah, he was, how in the world did that happen? He, uh, well, you know, I mean, he, uh, I was surprised to tell you that to tell you the truth that he wanted to do the movie. It's a rough movie. It's tough, very tough. It's still yeah. tough. It's still one of the tougher movies made. And, right. um, but, you know, he wanted to do it. Um, his wife didn't want him to do it. Uh, I totally believe that. Her. She was not happy. She wasn't, you know, crazy about me either, because of the script. Yeah, you know. sure. And I tried to ingratiate myself, and it's no sale. You know. And uh, anyway, um, but you know, I mean, he did it. He was great in it. We shot the whole picture in the Bronx. Um, people were yelling at him. A guy came over to him and said to him, "I'm going to knock your." punch your face out, something like that. And he said to this guy, big guy, he said to this guy, I'm going to get my wife up here and she'll kick you in the nuts. Get out of here. And the guy went, oh, he was so, you know, astounded by what the dude said to him. He, he just followed him around for the rest of the time. And he said to me, I'm going to take care of him. Don't worry, but nobody will bother him while I'm here. I said, all right, fine. You know, take care of yourself. You know, but, um, yeah, so it was, uh, the Newman was, we shot in the Bronx every day. We had all kinds of crazy adventures up there. Really, people threw bottles at us, Molotovs, a lot of crazy stuff happened. Yeah, it was it was a, it was a good time. Wow, yeah, it was a, it was an adventure of some time, for sure. Sounds like it. Yeah, it was. Any, any other any other fun little stories about any of the, the the famous folks that you've had the chance to work with? Well, you know, I mean, um, let me think. You know, so many and so few. It's a little bit way to put it, I guess. You know, I mean, I sure. Give anything of him, nothing is nothing as big as uh, as Fort Apache. Um, you know, we wanted. Uh, I can only say that that, that when we when they, when they wanted to make a cocktail, they asked me, "Who do you think you know should be in it? Who should play the remaining role?" So I said, ah, "I don't know, Nick Nolte. I like Nick Nolte. He looks like a bartender. He acts like a bartender. You know." They went, "Nick Nolte." 
Nick Nolte. Nick Nolte. What are you crazy? <laughs> yeah, and um, so the point, you know, and, and then I thought David Carradine. I liked. I love David Carradine. So I mentioned yeah. him. And they looked at me like, you know, something. Get out of the meeting. Go get some coffee. You know, I mean, they didn't say it, but they thought it for sure. You know, I read the articles that, uh, like, obviously the script went through many different iterations when Tom Cruise signed, and I actually got an earlier iteration of the script and it's it's funny to read it because there's a lot of you know new anecdotes and the story obviously went through a lot of different um iterations anything that you would have changed uh if you could do it again yeah uh the only thing i would have changed was and i had big fights about this which i lost um i hated when he punched the doorman i guess it's the old union i don't know what yeah, I get it. He, this, it's wrong to punch this guy. This guy is doing his job. Why are you doing this to him? He he doesn't care whether you go upstairs or not. He doesn't care whether you burn the building down or not. He doesn't yeah. care. But he's the doorman. His job is to keep you out. That so makes sense. I, I didn't want him to punch the doorman. That was my big, one of my big arguments, you know, which I lost. And um, it bothers me even today. Uh, when, when I talk about it, you know, because wow. I, feel that, um, I feel that it's not the way the, the rest of the picture is kind of good natured in a way. There's, there's drama in it, you know, but there's no, there's no, I mean, to, to me, to punch that doorman means you're looking down on him in a way. Yeah, that yeah. He's he's your inferior. And it's, that just bothered me. But um, I lived through it. <laughs> you know, I, respect I, that. I made it. I made it through, you know. That's right. I, I, mean, I respect that. You think of something? Yeah. I can't think of anything else offhand um, that I would have really changed. It'll it'll come to me later, probably when I when, when I think about it. But I have a lot of fights. There's a there's a scene in the book where people come to the bar dressed as their favorite drink, mm -hmm. and um, the director uh, Roger, who's a good director, a great director, just refused to shoot that scene. <laughs> he didn't want to shoot it. Yeah, I don't know. So maybe he thought it was too hard to shoot. Maybe he didn't like the scene. Obviously, he didn't like the scene because he didn't want to shoot it. Yeah. Other than that, um, when we finally got through the 45 or 50, and I'm not kidding, uh, rewrites that I did, we pretty much shot the script as is with a few of those. Yeah, I mean, you no, know, we shot that, that was in there as well, you know. And I remember, uh, and I mean, I don't know what he does to the doorman in my version of the script, but he does something funny and he gets up to the apartment anyway. And in this, while they were shooting it, he punched the doorman, which just annoyed me. What I'm going to read it because uh, it's sitting right up here on my desk. I'm going to read it whenever we finish, and I'll I'll uh, I'll remember. I'll figure out what it is. I'll send you an email. Oh, okay, good. Um, is Brian Brown really that funny in real life? Yeah, he's a funny guy. He enjoys life. He's a good time. He he didn't want to be a Hollywood guy. He liked. Yeah, he came in. He did a couple of Hollywood pictures very well, but uh, he's a real Australian. He he owned a theater in Australia. That he was very active in. He's very active in the Australian theater life, and also the Australian you know, movie life and TV life. He did a lot of that, so he didn't try to make a big career here, which he could have done if he wanted to. Right. You know, um, but he was fun. We we went out a lot. Got pretty looped a couple of times, and um, he was great in the movie. I thought. You know? Yes. Yeah. I, I I he might be my favorite character. Honestly, well, he really looks like a Upper East Side Manhattan bartender. If anybody who is watching knows what they look like, they know that's what Brian Brown looks like. You know, kind of a tough guy, a little bit older than the usual group, maybe in his late 30s, early 40s. They've been around a little bit longer, you know, booze is starting to show his face a little bit, that kind of thing, you know? Yeah. So, and, he, and, and, and the two of them, I mean, understood exactly how to do, do all the battle. They were great. The two of them. They worked together really well together, actually. Oh, they it was just it was magic. Yeah. I loved I loved it. You know, Cruz is um interesting guy. He's a real pro. No problems. Something he wanted to do, he did it, or you could talk him out of it or talk him into it. Uh no no friction on the set, no arguments with anybody, just a real pro. Yeah. You know, it was a pleasure actually. We played basketball and we held the court at this um at this gym in the village. For about an hour and a half, you know, winning all yeah, he's really good, winning all the games. And I finally said, I have to go smoke a cigarette now, I gotta quit. So I finally quit. And he stayed in the court with some other guys. So, you know. Yeah, he was it was a, it was fun being with him. I, I must have um 
very much a very kind of old school Hollywood style guy, you know. Yeah. Old school Hollywood style kind of guy doesn't want to get the wants wants the crew to like him, wants to show professionalism to the crew, so people will think he's a schmuck. Um, you know, wants to get along well. Uh, you know, wants to get what he wants out of the script. That's that, that was Cruise. Yeah, yeah, that's great. I've always been a Cruise fan. Obviously, yeah. Color of Money, Top Gun, yeah, uh, and of course, Cocktail. That. Tom, if, if by some chance you're watching, uh, you know, you've made Top Gun 2. I think, I think it's time for Cocktail 2. Just yeah, I saw Top Gun 2. Um, he's great in it, so that's what counts. And it was it big, he is. He is great. And it, it was a big success. I was glad. I was happy. I, I was glad for the whole movie business. The movie business really needed this to be a success. <laughs> Otherwise, yes. they, were, they had to prove that they could still make a movie like that and make it successful, which they did. Yeah, agree. Between that and the James Bond franchise uh, yeah. really coming back, uh, it was that was huge for the yeah. movie business, which I'm a huge fan of. I I always kind of set out I wanted to write scripts, and I wrote some in college, and they never really went anywhere. And uh, I got laid off from a job, wrote a book, it got published, and it led me uh, to where I am today. So definitely a testament to what what career can do. Yeah, Say what again. What book is this? I wrote a book uh, several years ago called Birth of a Salesman, and it creates it's a uh, fictional protagonist salesman um, who gets into sales by accident, but he writes a book with, inside a book and it's about selling. Right. And I've written four now. The last one was the most popular. It's called Salesman on Fire, hence the name of this podcast. Right. And what's Salesman on Fire about? Uh, the same character, but yeah. now he's middle-aged right. and uh, he's got a lot of ups and downs um, and finds out really the, the value of resilience in his career as a lot of I would say unfair things happened to him in his career. Yeah, it's funny. You know, I I had an uncle who was a salesman, and he was old style. He drove everywhere. He used to tell me, I've been in every city, every state, every mid mid-sized city in this country, I've been there. Yeah. I just wanted to do a story. I've been to a movie about this guy, I'm like a death of a salesman. That's already been done. I mean, that's not. And, um, you know, because he would tell me stories about, People he knew in various towns, and he would call when he got there. He had the same general route that he, you know, he, he sold office furniture, and he blacked everything in his back in his trunk. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, I mean, sales you know, is a rewarding career. You you just you learn a lot of people skills and a lot of the things that you talked about today. You know, being at the right place, right time, being opportunistic, um, and knowing how to get where you need to get. Yeah, yeah, he was. Um, but he had a bad temper, though. I found that interesting in a way because uh, it didn't affect his work any. It just affected his private life, I guess. I don't know. I couldn't imagine him running, selling anything to anybody if he got into an argument with them. I, I don't know. Yeah, sometimes finding that balance, that work-life balance, yeah. is very challenging I, for. I think of all the times I pitched shows, which is which is a sales activity. Well, you yeah. think it's a sales activity, and um, actually, I don't know about other kind of selling. But this is a selling a product that's already been bought in a strange way. They're going to hire you. And unless you do something really stupid, which has been done in the meeting, you got the job. And that's why they won't, they will not see people often because they know that they bought this. For some reason, pitching a show meant you were going to get a pilot deal. You were not going to, you know, you're not going to convince anybody in a room that the show was worth you know, uh, uh, doing or even piloting. But if but if they knew about it, if there was some kind of deal aspect, you know, connected to it, like a star or a writer or anything like that, or, or, or even a deal, a contract that they had with the studio, that they had the two or three pictures or shows to do, they hadn't done all their pictures and shows, they had to do one quickly, you know, before, before the time runs out, another reason. So anyway, there were a lot of uh, interesting kind of pitch ideas we told you you were a salesman, but the one thing that I found, and this is not true of other kinds of sales, I don't know if it is, was you better be kind of sold first. You yeah. personally, at least, better be sold first. They, they have to know who they're seeing. That makes sense. Otherwise, yeah. uh, reputation. Yeah. Reputation is key, and I think you see a lot of the similar things in the sales environment. I mean, everything you just described is very similar to being in a boardroom or with senior executives working with a company. Uh, you throw around a lot of ideas. You figure out what sticks. What are we going to work on together? And um, there's, you know, mutual accountability uh, without a doubt. What do you do, by the way? Uh, so I am a sales director for Microsoft. I've been here for nine years, and then I write on the side. Right. 
So you sell what you you sell Microsoft um, products, right? Okay. Yeah. So we, my team, supports the all up portfolio for Microsoft. So there's a big cloud business. There's hardware, uh, software, um, everything that a company might buy that is Microsoft related. My team will support that, and I work in the healthcare division of Microsoft. So right. um, our team supports med device and uh, medical technology. Do you travel a lot? Not uh, some, not a ton, but uh, you know, it's it's a perfect balance you know it's not too much not too little right because i thought that, 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 that there'd be less traveling now obviously because of all the uh internet kind of stuff yeah. definitely less than there used to be um i've got a few trips lined up which i'm really looking forward to and it's amazing what you can accomplish virtually like this but uh you know nothing beats the the face-to-face -face no, customer absolutely. meeting you know it's funny because i saw a documentary um about bible salesmen i don't know if you've ever seen that documentary oh. It's made by the Amazing Brothers, and it's kind of like, you know, your low-edge kind of guys who travel around and knock on the doors, you know, door-knocking Bible sales. When I saw that, I thought, there's got to be a movie in the sales life or a TV show, and there is not one now, nor how, can I ever think of one. I'm sure there's got to be something. Uh, we, I, I say we team up and we make one about my fictional protagonist. I'll send you, book. I'll books. I'll send you yeah. my books. Yeah. I'm going to read your book because there is because this 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 particular documentary is kind of down it's kind of down it's depressing because it's middle aged older guys who travel around the country smaller towns and they sell this Bible uh, program you know to people and they sell it online and not going to they go and ask the toughest sales and they were following around by this crew and when I saw that I thought wow this is a, that and the high level pressures having to sell one you know being told to sell this one thing yeah. to this one person and your career is writing on that sale you know it's great stuff it's absolutely true they it yeah. would be a great movie great show no. uh, i'm i'm envisioning haywood gould and carson hetty team okay. up for the, for the film or tv okay. show salesman on fire that's okay, what i envision great. okay i'll read your books i love it well i'll send you i'll send them your way hey okay. well, this was amazing thank you okay, so thank much you. I appreciate you so much, and uh, keep keep writing. I can't wait to read your great American novel. Okay, <laughs> right. Okay, we'll stay healthy then.